each of you guys touched on the role of narratives, norms, values. Um, and I, I tend to think of changes in norms and values of being a prerequisite to big, big or small policy changes. But that can happen at, at both elite and, and general levels, so the general public's norms and values changing. I guess um, for the cases that you guys have examined so far or are familiar with, uh, where do we think is most important there? You know, are norms and values changes most important at the elite level to make these changes happen? or at a broader level? And, and what can we say about where norms and values have changed and, and there hasn't been um, any real policy changes after that? Well, we'll take a couple questions, though. Please identify yourself first, too. Um, Carol Rakodi, I'm associated with the department here. Uh, in your examples, you didn't mention external factors. And one of the things that strikes me about countries which have success, had successful redistributive um, episodes is that they've disregarded external advice. Yes. So the countries that you're talking about, for example, Malaysia, paid absolutely no attention to the policy conventional wisdom of the time. And I'd be interested in your reflections on to what extent you think an, an, a, a, a willingness and an ability to disregard what they're being told by the international agencies if they think it doesn't apply to them, applies in the cases you're looking at. Uh, thanks, uh, Gareth Wall, uh, IDD in the Commonwealth Local Government Forum. Um, now here uh, mentioned local leadership. I was wondering if you could expand a bit more uh, in terms of the role and, and across the panel um, about the, the where people are learning about the roles of the, uh, thing. so what's the role of education, what's the role of the social movements in educating uh, leaders to be making these changes, uh, and then what does that mean for this program or academics in terms of education? Thanks. I think that the, the narratives, I, th I think of it in terms of symbols actually, so national stories, so in the case of Bolivia, digging into the 1952 revolution when people felt that this was part of Bolivian identity, it's the symbols and narratives that bind elites to the masses that are actually going to create the basis for redistribution. A lot of norm shifts kind of trickle down, if I can use that phrase, um, from elites to masses, and they might not be so useful. My, my hunch is that it's the, it's, the, it's the narratives that are already in the country that can actually provide the basis for this, but we'd absolutely have to test that. And then um, the external factors is really interesting because... Um, there were clearly external factors in a lot of these. Often it's external threat. You know, what would we have done without the Chinese Communist Party in terms of redistribution in Korea, redistribution in Taiwan? You know, and if you could just invent something like that for other countries, it would be great. Um, so, so external threat, which is not always replicable. Ignoring advice requires you to have a strong, coherent, to use a phrase from the past, national bourgeoisie, um, a, a national leadership which actually believes itself and doesn't send its kids to Chicago and believe everything that they're taught there. So there is a real question there about how you build that. It's certainly very true. You can see the influence of dissidents in the North, people like Joe Stiglitz, very important when he goes to advise Vietnam, for example, in terms of strengthening that sense that we can do this. It's not completely out beyond the pale. You know, so, so I think there's a role for dissident intellectuals in the, in the, uh, in the metropolis to actually support a greater range of experimentation out there uh, and just try and neutralize some of that sort of, pre of the advice that's coming uh, in other directions. Um, so yeah, coming back on these points about narratives and norms, um, I would say I guess it's got to be on multiple levels and I think um, what we know is that we know very little about how norms and values change and can change quite quickly sometimes and can take a long time to change. Um, but certainly, um, I think it has to be on multiple levels. So I mentioned with the Brazil case, there was this sense, much more awareness of this international ranking of inequality. And particularly, uh, Brazil to know within Latin America, it's one of the most unequal. Within Latin America, it had some of the um, higher percentage of unschooled and unskilled people. And these were sort of um, really, really instrumental in shaping norms for elites who were able to access that information. Um, then actual social movements had a really um, critical role as well. So we saw um, uh, sort of a lot of the social movements that came around the Workers' Party were then instrumental, and this relates to local leadership, 
in um, shaping what was uh, to become the zero hunger strategy. So there were actual social movements working way before that to bring that to the political agenda, to shape this narrative that lots of people were going hungry and that's not acceptable. So this idea of it being a right to not be hungry came about through this, uh, <coughs> through local leaders in social movements and then got capitalised on by Lula and really consolidated. Um, so talking about external factors, I gave an incredible whistle-stop tour, 25 years, so the paper does talk about it in more detail. Um, and I would say there were three sort of key external factors in Brazil, the Brazilian case. The biggest one was the, the threat of the global markets are going to destroy your country if you change this economic system. So this was really this overarching fear of um, Brazil, who's had this decades and decades of economic instability, and they got stability, you know, which was fluctuating under this president, Cardoso. And of course, no one wanted to vote in a different leader who might change that system. So Lula was pretty much held at gunpoint to, you know, you can't change this economic system. And that was very much driven by these sort of external factors. Um, another point is, um, of course, Latin America, at the same time in, during this period, a lot of the countries went left-leaning. They voted in leftist presidents, and this had a really big sort of uh, multiplier effect on lots of these countries, that it could be done. They could vote in a more radical leader, and they could bring about social change. Um, and finally, um, in terms of disregarding external advice, you find with the Brazilian example that donors weren't present in a lot of these discussions. But the World Bank was, and the IMF was, of course, because they held some money. Uh, and they were actually sort of at different points proposing different things. So actually, when they started to scale up Bolsa Familia, the, the World Bank, as far as I've been told by a World Bank senior person who was there, they weren't in favour of it. They said, oh, this isn't going to work. That was the sort of official line. <clears throat> but um, again, the people within the country went against that. But the crucial factor with Brazil is because it's a wealthy, upper middle income country, it doesn't have to listen to external actors as much as smaller countries. So I think it really depends on the country how much they can ignore external actors. Um, <coughs> so uh, the narratives question, I think, is a great question. I, it's, it's not one that um, I, I think we know enough about. So we know a lot about how, again, narratives get built. Uh, for, for bad purposes, for terrible purposes, in terms of, um, so we'd argue at the moment in India, there's a really successful movement of bringing this identity of this kind of right-wing Hindu sort of line. Uh, and I think that that's much clearer. I think the other way uh, isn't as clear, and I think it's, it's hopefully something that we'll, we'll find out more about. But yeah, no, I think that's a great question. Uh, the external um, uh, effects, so uh, I completely agree, and, and there are a lot of external um, factors to take into account. So, uh, again, this is quoting from, from the, um, the Milo book, the, the edited book on these three leaders, so it's a case study. So their argument is effectively one of the things that these leaders, so one of them's become far more controversial, so they only talk about the first period of Museveni's uh, uh, entry into uh, leadership of, of Uganda, but it's uh, actually managing that international domestic uh, was really, really key to their strategies and how they also played the donors, the international community, how they tried to create that space, and at times they couldn't. But so I think there's again this how they do that. I think is, is really key. And um, just a point with, with Cardoso. So until kind of the Bolsa Familia really took off, and, and you started seeing people trace it back a bit, and, and looking at his role uh, with regard to domestic politics, uh, there was a. The, the, the kind of public image of, of Cardoso was, uh, I remember two or three articles, which was this really represents the triumphant um, kind of success victory of, of neoliberalism, um, that we've got someone who is a dependency theorist um, who's now been converted and he's preaching our, our, our message. Uh, and actually, when, when you have time to look back and you look at this, uh, what, what exactly went on, it's a far more complex story. So uh, I think, again, that might be something that he was willing to, to play off. It, it certainly worked in his advantage to, to portray himself in that way internationally. Um, so yeah, I think there's, uh, again, that's a really, really uh, interesting area. The, the local leadership, the, the kind of how, how leaders become skilled, uh, again, uh, very cool question, and I, and I really wouldn't uh, know enough to, to, to be able to answer it, but the, the interesting thing about the Bolivia case is the way in which, uh, again, Mass was really successful in bringing these social movements together, but then what I think is uh, incredibly interesting is this new form of governance, or not necessarily a new form of governance, but managing to then bring the social movements into governance post uh, Morales' election, uh, and this has been a really, really incredible feature of, of, I think, the Bolivian system, which is it's not there for 
we go back to business, we're in power and we'll, we'll, we'll carry on as we are. It's how do we now bring a, a really strong link where we do have this feedback, where we are committed uh, to serving the interests that we said we would. So uh, I think the socialization process is really key there. Uh, but yeah, really important. Thanks, Jonathan Kennedy from UCL. Um, I just wanted to push you all a bit more on the question of external factors and specifically with the case of Brazil, I mean, it was interesting because all three of you mentioned Brazil as a case where inequality decreased over a sustained period of time from, I think, the beginning of the 2000s to the present day. And I was trying to think why that was and think of external factors. And of course, there's the financial crisis in 1998 um, and um, that was somehow brought about by capital account liberalization and then the IMF and other international, international institutions lent, what, 40 odd billion dollars to Brazil and I was, it seemed like a strange kind of um, coincidence because uh, um, there's been many other cases where there's been money lent by the IMF and other international institutions and um, predicated on structural and financial reforms and has led to increased inequality. So I was wondering why Brazil might have been different and why they had the policy space to perhaps pursue different, different um, routes to other, other developing or middle-income countries. So I was just wondering if I could push you a bit more on that, but thanks. My name is Richard Batley. I'm at the International Development Department. Um, I know a bit about Brazil, um, and I like Sean, uh, Sean's t uh, talk very much. I thought that there was another side, though, that she only sort of touched on. Um, the, the redistributive programs have been massively successful in redistributing. Um, the question is whether this is an, uh, an institutionalized process. These are targeted programs. Um, you indicated, you showed the slide of the uh, demonstrations around the country around the time of the uh, football, the World Cup, and about also the um, Olympic Games. Those demonstrations were at least partly targeted at the Workers' Party. It was not just targeted at generally corruption. Um, it was targeted at the failure of regular, not targeted services, um, the, uh, the, the poor allocation of public financial, uh, of, of public, uh, public resources. Um, there's another big issue which you mentioned, which is the um, increasing evidence of the involvement of the Workers' Party with um, corrupt relationships with state-owned enterprises, particularly Petrobras, which has been almost, well, whose board has been almost totally dissolved. Dilma Rousseff came from, of course, from Petrobras at the time that these things were going on. So, the, the, so you know, this is another aspect of the non-institutionalization or the wrong sort of institutionalization of a party, I suppose, as, as opposed to a, an anti-poverty process. Um, at the same time, the base in, uh, uh, Duncan talked about the, um, the, the masses, because the traditional base of the, work, of the Workers' Party was in organized labor and in the landless movement. Um, its, its base in the, work, in the unions is now much weaker, partly because the unions are much weaker, partly because the union, unionists are not on the whole the people who benefit from these targeted services. But the, workers, the, uh, the unions are weaker because also, let's say, Perhaps there was not a much choice, but the failure of economic policy, which is that Brazil has sort of reverted to being a dependent on China this time. Um, primary producing country, in industry has declined. So um, it, you could say that what we're seeing now is a sort of reversion to a sort of pre-1964, pre-military intervention, populistic sort of politics where the party reaches out to the masses, but the masses as individuals who are recipients of targeted benefits, as opposed to being based on mass movements. And, <coughs> and then we'll take another one. Um, thank you, uh, Alex Colden from the Tax Justice Network. Uh, really interesting project, and I'm kind of very keen to see where it goes, uh, but I have uh, kind of one point of caution. The framing of more history, less maths. I am more comfortable with the first part of this than the second. <laughs> um, and just uh, three yeah. kind of quick uh, things on that. Thinking about Brazil, you know, the, the research I think is reasonably consistent in suggesting that the impact on the genie, if uh, we must insist uh, on looking at the genie, of the <coughs> Bolsa Familia, 
is statistically not different from zero. Um, the big shift uh, is consistently from labour market changes, mm -hmm. which may not be unrelated, but it's not a direct Bolsa Familia impact, so it's worth thinking about that. The, the work across the region that Nora Lustig and others have done, their findings are pretty much that reductions in inequality appear to be kind of um, indifferent to whether governments are seen as being left or right, whether they're natural resources or not, whether the growth performance has been impressive or not. So I think there may be something more there than a Brazil and Bolivia story that you want to situate that in um, that, that may change the context. And just finally on data, I think there's probably an emerging consensus that the SALT extrapolations may be slightly heroic um, and the new version of the WIID data at UNU wider is probably the one to use, which incidentally would let you find out the, the Palmer as well as the Gini if you yeah. felt the need. <laughs> Can I just? Okay. Um, yeah, just one tiny point on Brazil to add yet another ingredient, which is that my, my reading of pe people's writing on it is that the education, education had a big role in changing inequality. But the question I want to ask was, uh, I think it's a great project, and now I'm going to spoil it by saying you should bring the economy back in. <laughs> because, um, well, you might call it against the stream. In many cases, the economy is moving in an inegalitarian way. So just looking at what's happening to the genie, you might have you know, done more than you think. But in one case, in Mauritius, I think that ex you'd find that the chief explanation <coughs> is going to be in the primary distribution of income, and it's the economy which became very, used a lot of labor intensive, a lot of employment and so on. Maybe, Sean, do you want to start since most of these were about Brazil? Great, yeah, really, really great points there. Um, on the first point about the IMF, I don't know. I think that's a really interesting question. Um, certainly at that period, Brazil was sort of in the good books and has become a bit of a poster child um, for um, taking on perhaps IMF advice or being an emerging economy. So I wonder if there was some sort of sense of leniency because, of course, they've treated different countries very differently and Argentina lost out uh, very harshly, um, which looked a bit unfair. So I think that's quite interesting, the way that they uh, treat countries differently. And actually, a big external factor, which I didn't mention was, and someone else I've mentioned it probably, Richard, was China and the commodities boom. And that was enormous in terms of um, reducing inequality because of the labour market effects. Um, so that was a really crucial factor. Uh, in terms of the other side of Brazil, uh, I absolutely agree, uh, Richard, you're, you're right. And it's hard to sort of get across the complexity. And I guess what all of these points bring out is the fact that there was a real confluence <coughs> of lots of actors, factors, policies, uh, some luck, some bad luck happening that brought together um, these changes. And it's finding sort of a coherent narrative to bring all that together and reflect all the points I think is quite tricky. And the, the point you brought up about uh, basically these policies buying votes I think is really important um, in terms of if you look at the Workers' Party's, uh, workers' party's uh, original um, support base that's, that's really completely changed and we saw that with the elections last year if you looked at the percentage of people who voted in the workers party uh, it had completely shifted whereas previously in the, the very poor northeast the uh, people had tended to vote more for their traditional families as far as clientelistic type of politics and what you found in the election last year is actually these people had changed affiliation which is quite <coughs> significant uh, and were voting uh, in for the Workers' Party. They were voting in their interest. They were getting money from this government. This government was working in their interest, and they changed their votes. And on the other hand, where the, P uh, the Workers' Party hasn't really benefited a lot of their more traditional sectors, they had started to turn against um, the Workers' Party. So I didn't particularly touch on uh, in the paper or the presentation the impact this has had back on politics, but this is a really, really crucial factor. Um, and corruption scandals are enormous um, with, with Dilma. We didn't really go into Dilma because the data stops at 2012. Um, but yes, these protests were very much an anti-political um, elites and institutions of which, I mean, I, don't, I think there were lots of elements within it that weren't just, and I don't think it was overarchingly against the government itself. I think it was against a bit more these institutions, but we probably might disagree on that a bit. <laughs> um, in terms of Brazil, labour market shifts, absolutely, and I didn't really give the breakdown, but according to um, the uh, calculations from quite a lot of people, labour market, labour incomes reduced inequality, were responsible for reducing inequality to about 50% of that reduction. 
and it's estimated that non-labour income, so that would be things like pensions, which are really significant, um, these uh, both of family and other benefits, they um, reduced inequality, they estimate, by around 40%, and about 10% is um, estimated to be due to demographic factors, with people having smaller families being a really significant part. Of course, you might contest these figures, but this seems to be the, the consensus. Education, absolutely crucial. And I didn't really sort of go into that, but actually under Cardoso, so one of the few social reform policies he managed to get through uh, quite successfully was increasing access to primary and secondary education. And that had a massive impact on these labour market shifts. So we had a lot more skilled people. We had a lot more um, educated people going into the workforce. They could suddenly earn a lot more. So actually the, the, the premium le leveraged on education uh, reduced. So And that happened actually at the tertiary level as well. All of a sudden, um, a lot more people had education and they could afford to get paid more as a whole. Uh, so I was, uh, just uh, in terms of the data set, uh, thank you. And I should have said we are planning on, so our focus isn't, it is more on these episodes. So I think we will try and use a range of sources, including WIAD, to, to, to sort that out. In terms of the, uh, the, just the point on the kind of manufacturing, the external and, uh, and the economy, I think uh, that's uh, exactly spot on. And uh, I, I don't think it would have been as, Interesting if, if we'd have spoken about that in our, in our presentations, but that's clearly one of the, the, the big things is uh, if you think of the East Asian countries where, again, that uh, inequality went down significantly, uh, there wasn't necessarily a, shit, a focus on inequality. There was no real emphasis on reducing inequality. There was land reform, but it was the manufacturing sector boom. And I think in a number of those cases, I, I do think that's going to come up, and I think that in itself will be very interesting is actually, is it a direct focus on inequality that tends to produce the best results? Or is it when you're, you're promoting employment through manufacturing uh, development, that's actually where you see the biggest uh, results? So I, I think that's uh, exactly right, and I think that's really what we're interested in. Uh, but I do feel, so with the Lustig paper, I mean, part of it was that there is this combination that it's economics and, and the centre-left governments have been really successful. And I do think there's... What we're going I mean, this is an empirical question when, when we start to look at these cases, but uh, I think, again, it could be very... It, it's how we then tease out those different effects and how we look at whether governments were able to take advantage of, of external shocks, of, of changes in the global economy and, uh, and those types of factors. So I, I think that's exactly uh, right. So, yeah, thank you. So Brazil 98, Asia crisis was a really interesting kind of turning point, I think, in a lot of the big debates. Um, it was a kind of high watermark of capital account liberalization. The IMF was just about to reform its articles of agreement to make capital account liberalization part of its mandate. And it all suddenly started, went into reverse after the Asia crash and rapidly followed by the, the Brazil and long-term capital management. Um, but also, there was the Argentina crash in 2000, 2001. So I think if you're in Brazil around then, you suddenly see the confidence of the neoliberals dented and an enormous meltdown going on next door in Argentina, I think that probably did create some space despite the, 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 the IMF package. So you'd have to look a bit more closely at that. No one likes more history, less maths except me. Harjun hates it. Um, <laughs> if I change it to more history, less modeling, is that okay? I'll, I'll work on that one. Um, uh, uh, sorry? <laughs> yeah. You've just lost my, anyway, never mind. Um, <laughs> back to narratives. Um, and uh, I think what we're gonna find out is that an awful lot of this is this question of luck, confluence, yeah, inequality falling as an unintended consequence of policies. And then it becomes, a, the question actually becomes, is that, is it, does that matter? And is it a question of fortune favoring the prepared mind and sort of good leaders seize moments which just appear? And, and that's probably why I also didn't really like the bit I wrote, because it wasn't sufficiently kind of campaignable. Like, wait for something to happen and then grab it is not a great campaign model. Um, well, it is a great campaign model, it's just not a good message. Um, so, so I think we, we're going to have to... The whole question of serendipity is going to become really huge in this and what, and what that means for research and policy. 